Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2% Better Health Podcast. I am your host, Carrie Bennett. And today I have with me a longtime client and also someone who's really dove deeply into the, I guess, I guess I would label it as alternative health world, but I think that these things should be mainstream. Um, this is Carol Kamerman. So Carol, welcome. Um, I'm really excited to have you here because what we're doing today is a little bit different than what I've done on previous podcasts. Today, we're just breaking down the first three podcasts that I've done, and Carol is going to come at it from her perspective as a client. She also has a, I, I don't know, what is it, 30 or 40 years as an educator, <laughs> and so you right? So I mean, her background is in education, so she's been listening to these podcasts as both a client and also an educator and has come up with a couple of like, you know, takeaways and questions, and let's break this down a little bit more, or what do you think about this? Or this is how I incorporated that. And so uh, I really want to kind of touch on both the maybe uh, re-summarizing some of the, the quantum science, because I think that's, well, selfishly, I love explaining that. I don't know if other people want to hear it, but selfishly, I love explaining it. And also the bite-sized takeaways that people can take from that science and how to apply it to make their health just 2% better, just layer it on, layer it on. Um, so welcome, Carol. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I'm glad to be here today. Um, two things, right? Two things. Number The first thing that I wanted to highlight is for those of you who are watching this on YouTube or just have seen this show through my YouTube channel, I actually have, I, I want to say four or five previous episodes of this podcast that are available only on Spotify right now because they're audio only. It's before I... <laughs> It's before I got savvy enough to record a Zoom meeting, right? <laughs> and so, um, and so those three, the first three are the ones that Carol's going to be going over. So I think it's also helpful to know that one of them is going, one of them is more about healing with light. One of them is kind of a quantum perspective on how to be a fat burner. And the other one is um, a, a quantum perspective on sleep and that self-cleaning that our body does while we're in deep sleep mode. So um, are you okay, Carol, if I share a little bit of your health journey to... I'd be glad to have you do that. Okay. Okay. So Carol has like, listen, if uh, this is why I love working with Carol, because Carol has faced so many challenges, so many challenges. And I want to talk about her, her journey, her journey, right? I, I believe it was breast cancer first, followed by chronic Lyme, no Lyme and then breast cancer. Okay. Chronic Lyme disease, breast cancer, breast implant illness, um, there, uh, I mean, she was hospitalized for COVID everyone and she's doing beautifully right now. What, what else, Carol? You, I mean, there's, there's, um, mold, oh, mold toxicity. toxicity. Yeah, mold <laughs> toxicity. I mean, I, I, I do feel like Carol has faced over the past decade, like a lot, a lot of hurdles, we'll call them hurdles. And every single time it seems like you come at it like a champ and you put on like your little teacher, plus like research, researcher, teacher helmet, and you go at it. Right. And you try to figure out exactly what's going on in your body. And so it's from this perspective that we're diving into these quantum topics today. And I'm really excited for you to just kind of help us break them down and digest them maybe in a way that's more applicable or a little bit easier to understand. Okay. I can do that. Okay. So what, what the, the, the first, the first episode was about healing with light. Right. And so we talked about circadian rhythm. We talked about the light frequencies and, and the fact that light is, it's not only miss, I mean, it's underappreciated, underappreciated and very misunderstood in terms of its importance for promoting optimum health. Um, and so what, what were your questions or takeaways from that episode? Um, I think first and foremost, it was how, how do I fit that into my day? I mean, um, getting out into the daylight um, when maybe I'm working on something that has to be done inside. Maybe I'm in the car uh, for a great portion of a day traveling somewhere. Um, my struggles with um, the sunrise sunset. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a morning person right now. I'm retired and um, I've seen many sunrises. And um, just the, my sleep pattern um, was not conducive to seeing the morning, first morning light. So um, in terms of just everyday living, my questions were basically, how do I fit um, exposure to light uh, into my day, especially when it's so diverse? I think that's, I think it's perfect. And uh, it's a great question to start off the bat with because we put a lot of pressure on ourselves when we're incorporating any 
health change to do it perfectly, right? Like it's gotta be perfect. I have to see every single sunrise and I have to be out there for two hours and that's the only way I'm gonna get the benefit, right? And so I think we need to first break it down by saying any time that you can get outside in natural light with naked eyes, it's going to be an extra, it's going to be extremely beneficial to your body. And then likewise, anytime when you're inside, I, I, whenever I'm recording these podcasts, I have zero artificial light on, right? So I don't have an outside light source kind of messing with my brain. I do have this computer screen, which I have protected with the Iris tech software. I've got my glass. I mean, I got protection. I've got an open window in front of me. Lucky, luck, lucky me, right? I got this beautiful open window in front of me, letting the natural frequencies into my environment. And so when I'm inside, my goal is to make my inside environment as non-toxic as possible. And then anytime I go outside, I have to have my naked eyes and as much skin in the game as is humanly possible. Literally, even if that means it's a sunroof while you're driving to the grocery store, or it means that like when I park at school and I'm waiting for, you know, pick up for my kids, windows are down, sunroof is open. I try to angle my car into the spot where, you know, I get the light frequencies in the strongest and it's not about being perfect. It's, but it is about making sure you're consistent the little consistent bits of light that you add into your day, it's like your, your mitochondria get to chomp on those and take all that information to do something amazing with, to heal the body. And then in the meantime, you're trying to kind of mitigate and protect when you're in your internal environment. Okay. Well, um, I guess what I'd like to, to kind of share with people in regard to that kind of thing is that um, what do I do to try to put 2% of any of the things that your podcasts are about? How do I put those into my life? And so I kind of broke it down into um, a few categories and I'll just mention sure. those. But sure. as we talk through some of these, people can kind of have a sense of how I approach things. Cool. Um, the first thing I try to do is surround myself with people. You know, I call it my tribe. Um, people who um, support me, people who encourage me, um, people who I, I can go to for um, ideas, suggestions, um, or I can share my ideas and suggestions with. So to me, that's really important. Um, the second thing I do is to re recognize the rewards of feeling better. Um, I'm from, I'm old school, or I was old school. I was the kind of person who you know, you go to the doctor, you have an illness, you have a problem, a symptom, the doctor usually prescribes medication and within three or four days, you feel better. Well, what I've learned throughout this whole process and this journey I've been on is that it didn't take three or four days for me to get where I was. So it's going to take a lot longer for me to maybe see the benefits um, of some of the things I did. So not to be discouraged and to just stick with it. Um, also accepting backsliding. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happens. I do it. I think we all do in various ways in our life. And I just feel like accepting the fact that I, I did backslide, but I can move forward again and not to give up and get discouraged. And then the last thing um, that I would like to mention is recognizing obstacles. Um, as you well know, Carrie, uh, working with me for the last few years, um, there are certain things that you were recommending that we discussed, and I came up with a reason that that won't work for me. Uh, <laughs> and what I've learned is, um, and very thankfully through you, that um, it's an obstacle I'm putting in, in place. I'm not allowing myself to problem solve necessarily to find ways to do things. One of the things I'll use as an example is I'm not, I don't, don't get morning light that much. Um, and well, before I say that, when I think about the overall picture here with um, how light benefits our health, it's overwhelming. And that's where that 2% comes in. Mm -hmm. So um, knowing that one of my difficulties is the morning light, uh, I try the best I can and sometimes I'm successful, but I know this, I can sit and enjoy the evening light. I'm always out, outside, uh, even on cloudy days and evenings, I'm always outside for that end of daylight. So, okay, there's a 2% right there. So if I make that a habit and do it every day, now I can start to think about, well, now what can I add? Mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and I began to just build on all of the suggestions that you've given, um, all of the things that really are needed um, to benefit me light-wise. 
And I'm still, you know, I'm a work in progress Mm -hmm. Um, and I always will be. But at this point, um, you know, I've picked up more than just sitting out in the evening light. You know, I do the, I wear the glasses now at night, the Mm -hmm. amber uh, glasses, the blue blockers. Yeah. Um, I try to um, limit uh, the amount of screen time. And I very happily can tell you that last week, my screen time was down 80%. Unbelievable to me, but hey, I'll take it. So I guess you know that's kind of where I would go with with those kinds of things. Um, Can I touch on that really quickly? Sure. Um, th- let's let's talk about sunrise and sunset because uh, they're they're both important parts of the day, right? And I, I want to highlight. So this this is not my phrase. This is from Dr. Courtney Courtney Hunt, who I think is really brilliant when it comes to incorporating the light, right? But she calls it sunrise, sunshine, sunset, repeat, right? Sunrise, sunshine, sunset, repeat, and it's a beautiful mantra because each part of the day is important for us. Um, if I were to highlight, and so this is, and an, I know you're not going to take this the wrong way because if I were to highlight for what one time of day that is the most important and the optimum. For clients to get, it is that sunrise light. And there's a reason for it, right? But mm-hmm. I'm so glad that you didn't let that discourage you from not getting outside and getting the sunshine for the vitamin D in the middle of the day. And then the sunset in the evening in order to allow your brain to start recognizing that it's nighttime. Um, with that morning light though. And so this is, this might be a motivating factor for either you or for anyone else who's listening, right? That morning sunlight and uh, maybe, maybe not a motiv- motivating factor for you, Carol, because you are retired, right? <laughs> yeah. And you get, you, you've earned your sleep in time perhaps, but, but for those of you who are, who are still maybe waking up to go to work and can't find the time to just carve out two minutes at sunrise, mm-hmm. it, that sunrise in your eyes is 200 times more potent to your brain than a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee will give you that artificial caffeine energy, but the perfect blend of light frequencies as the sun comes to the horizon and then lifts above the horizon. So you get this window, this like 30 minute window, let's say, right? 30 minute window, an hour window, sometime within that sunrise window, you get this perfect blend of light frequencies where The red light helps to optimize your mitochondrial function. The blue light that comes there turns on your pituitary gland, your hormone centers in your brain. And then also the morning light in your eyes is what tells your mitochondria to start to make its master hormone pregnenolone, which then becomes all of your other sex hormones or steroid hormones are the same thing um, throughout the day. So that morning light is really key. And so for those of you who are still working and also dealing with a chronic health condition, I really, really encourage it, but do not let perfect be the enemy of good, right? Like you just said, you have been so, so consistent with sunset. You've been so consistent with blocking the blue light, with minimizing the screen time at night, with going to bed and honoring your fatigue, right? You know, hopefully falling asleep, not on the couch, but like in bed, right? And <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and so, so that then could, will translate to an additional 2%. So when your body is ready, you will layer on that, that morning sunlight uh, st- more strongly. My other hack for that though, is this is the perfect time of year for people who like to sleep in a little bit later to start practicing sunrise in the eyes. Because well, at least where we live, right, Carol, where we live, sunrise is now 7.30 a.m. And then it's only going to get later and later and later. And so if you are not a morning person, use winter as a time to get that morning sunlight in your eyes, because you'll be able to get it in Michigan from, I want to say, it'll probably be like crazy, like 8.30 until 9.30 or 10.30, somewhere in there. And so if 6 a.m. in the middle of summer sounds too crazy for you, then take advantage of winter. You have, you just have to go outside. And literally in the winter, all I do is I have my screen door right into the backyard. I literally open it like this and I stick my head out with naked eyes and I just sky gaze at the trees for like, you know, two minutes, three minutes, however long until my kids call me back in to do something. And so this is actually a really good time. And so I'm, I'm excited, Carol, for you, now that you've got the sunset part down for maybe for you to take advantage of the winter sunrises to see what that does. And that's really my goal. Um, we've discussed that too. Um, the fact that since sunrise is a little later, mm-hmm. I should be able to start incorporating that. One other thing I wanted to mention, um, when you said, you know, in the winter, you, you know, you just open the door and kind of stick your head out through the screen. 
that's important too, because I, I remember um, asking you about that at one point and you said, well, now wait, um, you don't want to have like a storm door on mm -hmm. because now you're filtering just like mm. you would, like I would with my glasses on. So it needs to be either open the door, like really open the door or the screen. So I think that's important for people to know and remember. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. So light, yeah. light is a part, it light has something called duality, right? And you know this, I've talked about it, but it's, it, it travels like a wave. So picture it like water and picture it like a particle, like a bullet, right? It, it can do both at the same time. It's an amazing, it's amazingly beautiful quantum property. It's got this duality. And so unfortunately picture glass, right? Glass has no holes in it and glass will block the majority of those beneficial frequencies of the red light, the infrared light, and even the UV light. Like there are, there, there are key ends of the spectrum that glass will block and we're, and we are now missing. Here's a side note. Like, you know, there's a, a lot of people are like, well, you know, I was a truck driver for years and I, I got skin cancer because of the light you got, you may have on my left side, right. You know, you may have had that because you were filtering out certain frequencies of light from the glass that was in your truck window, right? You are not getting the beneficial healing red light and infrared light frequencies. You are concentrating the blue light frequencies. You were probably actually blocking the UV too, for that matter. And so um, that's, that was just a side note. I digress on that, but the glass does block out some of the beneficial frequencies. So the coolest thing ever, right? Because light behaves like a wave, you literally only have to have something open a crack it's like, it's like having an aquarium full of water. Picture the water as the same thing as light. All you have to do is poke a tiny little hole in that aquarium and all of the water comes out. All of the frequencies of light can come in. And that's the same effect of the screen. You're exactly right. So in the winter on days when it's not insanely cold, my kitchen faces east. And so when I'm doing morning dishes, I will crack open that window and just have a little tiny bit coming through just to let those natural light frequencies come unfiltered and into my environment. Yes. Oh, that's great. Cool. Yeah. And, and then I also want to say, um, you're the reason that people look at me funny when I'm driving down the street <laughs> in the winter, because um, if it's a sunny day and it's not, you know, overly cold, I have my sunroof open. <laughs> bravo, bravo. I'm proud of you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's the other thing that I'm already doing. So, you know, I didn't start all those things at once. I started just one. Yeah. And then I added the next thing and the next thing, as you mentioned earlier, layering. And throughout this entire conversation today, um, to remember, for people to remember that layering is, is the key. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't feel overwhelmed because if you feel overwhelmed, you'll probably quit doing things sure. just because you just. And you, Carol, up. you know, all stages, right? We, we have people listening who are probably, you know, of really good health anyways, right now. And they're just looking to optimize, but you've been in that position of the person who literally cannot get off of the couch, just so much fatigue, so much pain, whatever it might be. And it's like every little task seemed daunting. And yeah. so you're exactly right. You have to, you either have to just slowly start to layer it on and do the best you can, or you really have to get someone in your life who can be like, okay, every sunrise, I'm there with you. Let's go. Or every sunset, I'm there with you. Let go. Cause that, that accountability buddy is a huge aspect of this too. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, that, that's very huge. Um, you know, with the, with the health issues that I had, um, some of them were pretty severe. Um, it would have been real easy to just give up, you know. And um, fortunately, I had people um, who encouraged me, um, you being one of them. Um, but, you know, on a daily basis, I had friends that checked in on me and mm -hmm. made sure that I was doing some of those things. Um, my son as well, who's a, a pediatric chiropractor in Omaha, but, uh, you know, he's been very encouraging. So. Um, yeah, I mean, and none of those things really, well, most of those things don't cost one cent. Right. And that's another key. I'm retired, you know, I'm not a millionaire. Um, but I, my health is real important to me. So, um, to remember that a lot of what we talk about today is free. Not getting stuck in this, I, this concept of, I, I need the next device or supplement or practitioner to heal me, right? It's like, oh, this supplement is supposed to heal me or this practitioner's modality is supposed to heal me or this new device is supposed to heal me. And it's like, wait a second, you heal yourself 
And yes, you've nature, the world, God has provided you with all the tools that you need to do that. And this is, we're just laying the foundation of that. If I, I, I really truly believe, and I think you would agree with me too on this. If, if these foundational things are not in place, you're wasting your money with the latest supplement or the latest tech gadget, right? Or, or at least not getting the most benefit that you could from it. Uh, these things are really foundational when it comes to just optimizing your health and, and feeling as best as you can and thriving. Anything else with light that we need to discuss with that heal with uh, light? No, I just, I, I want people to understand that it is achievable, um, mm -hmm. that um, you really kind of have to even encourage yourself some days. Mm -hmm. to do the right thing. Uh, the right thing being, uh, any of those things we've listed really. Mm -hmm. And even if you can't do multiple things in a day, if you even just do one, it's better than none. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I'm pretty much in a, in a habit now of, um, many of the, um, of the things we'll talk about today, but I still have some like the morning, mm -hmm. the morning light that I'm working on. Cool. And, um, it's, it's one of those things it's, it's ongoing. And the fact that light is super important. I mean, it's probably one of the most important in my mind, but all the things we talk about, um, you know, healing and feeling good and good health are multifaceted. And it's not just getting out in that morning light, getting out in the evening. And as we're going to talk further, there are so many other aspects to mm -hmm. good health. And all I want is the best health I can get for myself. Sure. So no, that's perfect. That's exactly it. You really, you do, you have to believe it and see it. There is, there is a mindset and a mentality to that. You have to see yourself well so that your body knows where it needs to head. Okay. So the next, the episode number two, uh, we talked about, um, how to be a fat burner and, uh, th this isn't for vanity purposes, right? I mean, sure. We all want to feel good and look, look good and feel good. Um, that's beautiful, but I think we really need to understand that, um, in terms of the the metabolic benefit, uh, it, it, it means that when we're a fat burner, we have a lower inflammatory state and we're making more water, more of that intracellular water, and we're making more energy. Well, I'm not going to call it energy because I kind of disagree with that, but we're making more cellular currency. We call ATP, right? We call ATP. And this happens in our mitochondria. So this is where we are looking at what are we doing to support our mitochondria so that we can Take, either burn fat that's coming from other outside sources, you know, fat from other animals or olive oil, that sort of thing, or we're burning our own fat. Ideally, we're able to burn our own fat and burn it and, and transform that into a fuel source for our body so that we can thrive. So on a uh, smaller scale, we can burn two different fuel sources, right? We can burn sugar or we can burn fat. Nine times out of 10, the people that I see on a day-to-day, -day uh, you know, coming into my clinical practice are sugar burners, right? They're, they're definitely sugar burners, which means that they take electrons mostly from sugar and sugar. I hate the word sugar. I hate the word carbohydrate. I, they all need to be called one thing because really anything that is a carbohydrate breaks down into sugar, except for the fiber component, everything else in it breaks down into sugar. And so you could be a, a, healthier sugar burner, or you could be burning that crap sugar from, you know, Reese's peanut butter cups all day long. But either way, we would, we take that sugar and we pull the electrons from that sugar and that electrons then go down the electron transport chain in our mitochondria to eventually make ATP and water. When we burn sugar, that elect, those electrons from the sugar have to go, have to bounce. There's five steps, right? And the fifth step being making the ATP. Sugar electrons enter at step one. And so they have to make all five steps in order to make ATP. Electrons from fat start at step number two. So you automatically, you save energy because you're skipping a step right there. So they start at step number two and then they jump down the electron transport chain to make energy. So that's number one. Fat actually is more efficient because there's less, um, less steps for it to burn in the electron transport chain for that electron to become energy. But the other thing about it is that when we burn fat, we make four times as much ATP and four times as much water than when we burn sugar. So if you are dealing with an inflammatory condition, if, if you're dealing with, I mean, all of my nutrition questionnaires, like the top thing is always fatigue, 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 and inflammation, fatigue, and inflammation. If you're dealing with fatigue and inflammation and you're a sugar burner, 
you're stuck in a rut, right? You are, you are never able to make enough energy to overcome that inflammatory state. So you're literally just spinning your wheels. Your body is making inflammation from this chronic inflammatory process. And you're only burning sugar, which is four times less energy. It's also dehydrating because it's four times less water. So that is why I encourage burning fat as a fuel source. And there's a lot of ways which we can go about that, but Carol, from that episode two, what were your takeaways, things, things that you like to do from it, um, suggestions, clarification, what do you think? Well, I think one of the biggest questions I had when we were discussing that, um, when I would have appointments and things with you, um, in fact, just recently we did that again because I tended to forget, but it was like, what do you mean I he- need to eat more fat in my diet? Like what? I, you know, all I can think of is like butter and ghee and you know, I mean, Yum. what about food? <laughs> <laughs> and so we, I mean, you sat right there and, and you talked to me about that. And I think it's real important for people to understand that um, there are a lot of healthy fats that we can put into our diet that are really good for us. Um, you've mentioned before, like the grass fed meat, um, raw cheeses, avocados, olives, um, pistachios, um, in, in a variety of other, other, other foods that I just, I'm not going to list them all, sure. but if you, um, if you wonder, you know, well, what, what should I eat? You know, ask, um, you know, find someone to ask, Google it if you need to, but no, I mean, don't, 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 don't Google it. Okay. <laughs> Google it. okay. No, 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 you, you could, I guess you could, yeah, I guess you could Google. Google yeah. Well, Dr. Google isn't always the most, yeah, I understand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's, so, here, that's a good yeah. point though, in terms of the fat, it's like, it, everyone has a different, like, I guess, amount of fat that their body needs to flip right. their switch from being a sugar burner to being a fat burner. Uh, in, in the technical terms, you are, uh, you know, burning the uh, glycolysis, right? You're in glycolysis to ketosis, right? And so some people, yes, they have to be in full blown ketosis in order to do that, which means in general, you have to consume four times as many calories from fat than carbohydrates and proteins combined, which in, if you, if you think about a plate like that, right. If if you, I, I, I feel like I, Oh, do you know what I did? I, I mean, I've been eating in ketosis for a while now. And I remember for my husband's work, we had to do these, um, like these online wellness assessments. And I remember the first year we did this, I put in what I legitimately ate uh, and, you know, so, cause, cause I eat a bunch of fat, right. I eat a ton of fat and I eat a bunch of, you know, animal, like healthy animal based fats and stuff like that. And they red flagged me <laughs> as being, having such an unhealthy diet. And they, they asked me to get a, um, an appointment with one of their nutritionists. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, okay, so that's why I don't want you to Google it because this information isn't necessarily mainstream <laughs> being mainstream taught, but it's, imp- it's important to know that you either have to eat fat or burn your own fat. And it's hard. If you've got any form of insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, elevated fasting, blood sugar, any of those things are going to make it very hard for your body to say, oh, Carrie's not feeding me right now. So I'm going to not worry about it. I'm just going to tap into body fat and burn that as a fuel source. So instead you have to be more diligent about eating other outside fats until you coach that pathway, that biochemical pathway strong enough that your body says, oh yeah, this is my default pathway. This is what I want to do. And like I said, for some people, and I know we've gone over this, Carol, for some people, you have to eat three to four times as much fat as you do protein and carbohydrates combined, but it doesn't necessarily have to stay there. Once you're an efficient fat burner, it's, it's really easy to bounce out of it and then go back into it. Like, what did I have? Oh, yesterday, you know, we had, um, we had a cauliflower crust pizza from, oh, maybe jets or something like that. I ate, I, I ate a whole cauliflower crust pizza, right? That's <laughs> like, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a decent amount of food, right? It's not low carb. Don't, don't let them fool you. That is not low carb. That's chock full of carbs. And this morning when I woke up, I was st- still in ketosis, right? I was 0.6 still in ketosis. So like, once you get that ability to burn sugar, and then once that sugar is gone, your body goes, Nope, don't want to burn sugar anymore. I'm going to go right back into ketones and right back into burning fat. It's an easier thing. However, the reverse is not true. If you are a sugar burner, you, your body is going to be, stay stubborn. It's going to be like, I'm going to burn sugar. I'm going to burn sugar. I'm going to burn sugar. And it's going to have a very hard time wanting to burn fat as a fuel source. So that's where we have to reframe our brain about what a, an acceptable meal looks like. 
you know, what does an acceptable plate look like? Cause I know a lot of people think an acceptable plate in terms of helping my body burn fat is a big old salad with chicken breast and a drizzle of olive oil, right. With a lot of veggies. And that doesn't necessarily cut it for a lot of people when they're coaching. And that's what I would call a healthy sugar burner, right? You're, but you're still probably burning up a lot of carbohydrates. What are your thoughts, Carol? Well, first of all, I'll tell you that um, this has been one of my largest struggles mm -hmm. through everything, yeah. uh, as you well know. Um, and I'm happy to report to you today. <laughs> the last week, um, I have been in ketosis a lot more than out. So Excellent. I'm getting there. But you know what? I mean, this is for the listeners, too. Um, it has taken me oh, a good eight months to even get there. I know some people can get there in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, not me. Yeah. And for, for multiple reasons, I think um, one of them is um, the more you know um, about how to go about it, the better you are at doing it too. Mm -hmm. um, when I would think I was doing great, um, maybe not so great. Maybe there were a lot more carbs in something than I thought. Mm -hmm. So I think it's real important. There are two tools that I use. Um, and um, I, I, I firmly believe in them for me, at least. Sure. What are they? One of them is uh, Keto mm. Mojo. Sure. And this, this measures my ketones and my glucose. Um, and then it will, um, it can sync with my, my iPhone. And then I can get, um, I can find out if I'm in ketosis or not. Sure. Um, this has been really, really good for me. Um, I, I like it a lot. You had that continuous glucose meter for a, a little while too, but you find I this said, is more, well, this is more helpful. You know, yeah. And I, you know, I'm a numbers person. Mm -hmm. So I found that um, I'm less apt to check my, my numbers, you know, 15 times a day, if I have to poke my finger, not that that hurts, mm -hmm. but you know, I mean, that's a lot of poking uh, mm -hmm. versus just taking my phone and putting it up to that. And basically that's just measuring my glucose anyway. Right. It's not measuring my ketones. Right. So, and, and to me, my ketones are, are important too. I've got to get mm -hmm. that balance in there to know, you know, what's, what's good. The other thing that I just started using, um, is called, it's, a, an app called Nutra coach. Cool. I like that, uh, app because, um, I can put brand names even in of things ah, and it will give me the carbs, the fats and the protein. So, um, I just stumbled upon that, uh, last week and I tried it and I liked it a lot. That's awesome. Um, so that's, that's a good one. It's called Nutra coach. Nutra coach. Do you know what? I like that too, because so let, I want to clarify that math, right. When we talked about eating more fat than carbs and protein. So mm -hmm. what, what you're going to, what does that app tell you how many calories you're eating in yes. fat? Okay. That's perfect. Right. Cause otherwise you do have to convert grams of carbs and protein into calories and then grams of fat into calories. And the conversion's not the same, right. For every one calorie of fat, or for every one gram of carb, it's four calories for every one gram of protein, it's four calories, but for every one gram of fat, it's nine calories. So otherwise you have to do some math, right? So right. with an app like that, that's helpful because you can then at the end of the day say, okay, I have had, I don't know, uh, 1500 calories of, uh, fat and I've had 500 calories of protein and carbohydrates. And that would be a, a, a three to one ratio, right? That would be a good ratio to attempt to see how your body handles that in terms of getting into ketosis. Right. Right. Perfect. So, um, anyway, that's, that's pretty much it. I, oh no, it isn't really. Um, I also do intermittent fasting. Now, mm -hmm. when I first started with that, um, when that was first recommended to me, I'm like, oh, I can't fast. <laughs> I have tried to not eat multiple times and it is horrible. I get, we had the same conversation so about you putting your phone on airplane mode too. <laughs> 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 but go ahead. I digress. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, there's no way I, I just, I've tried it and, and it's uncomfortable and I don't like it. Well, there's the 2% thing again, you know, instead of doing the 16, eight, which I do of 16, uh, fasting and eight in, you know, in my mm -hmm. eating window, uh, or sometimes less than eight. Um, now, um, I started out with 12 and 12. And one of the things I did in my head, I said to myself, okay, well, I'm going to be sleeping probably, I don't know, six to eight of those hours anyway. So then you put that in your head and you realize, okay, then I really only have like you know, like four or five hours here where I have to really, you know, just refrain from eating. Well, okay. Before I go to bed, I don't eat. 
Um, a lot of times, first thing in the morning, I wouldn't eat. So I'm, I'm saying, okay, I can do 12. Then I went to 14. Mm -hmm. Then I went to 16. And then eventually, and this is months later, I did a 24 hour fast and I got to hour 23 and I said, okay, I'm done. And then I said to myself, my gosh, you've done 23 hours. What's one more. And so then I was able to get to that. Um, I I'm not saying I do that on a regular basis because I don't, but I do try to stick with that 16, eight. Now, uh, last week I was on vacation. I was with, uh, family members, you know, relatives and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. but it was okay. It was okay. I, I recognized that that was just a week where, you know, I did the best I could. It wasn't like I said, Oh, forget it completely, but mm -hmm. I did the best I could, but you know what? I'm, I came right back to it. And frankly, I really kind of like it. And I find myself less hungry. Intermittent. That's a great point. Uh, intermittent fasting, I feel like is um, if you can ease into it, I think it's one of the best things we can do because it takes the thought of what am I going to eat out of at least one meal a day? right? It was like, what am I going to eat for breakfast? Or what am I going to eat for dinner? Like, and you just don't even have to think about it. Like, the body says, no problem. I've got my own internal fat that I could take out and burn to bridge the gap, right? I, I can burn ketones for you. That's not a problem. And so I really have felt like that for the majority of my clients, intermittent fasting is, it's been a lifesaver in terms of like, just not having to plan like back in the day, like when I was a horrible nutritionist. Now that I think about it, I, I didn't even have a nutri nutrition degree. Not that you need a nutrition degree. No, this was back when I was in my, you know, my personal main personal training days. And it was like, well, you got to eat, you know, every two to three hours or else you're going to go into starvation mode. Right. <laughs> Obviously I do not believe that anymore. I think that's a bunch of BS. And, um, but also can you imagine like what mental challenge all day long to be like, okay, well, my breakfast is this, then two hours later, I'm going to have this. And then two hours later, I'm going to have this. And all day long, all you're thinking about is like what your next meal is going to be. And then that's six opportunities for you to pardon my French fuck up. And then all of a sudden you think the day is over, right? It's like, Oh, I, I ruined it today. So now I'm going to just, you know, be done for the day and I'll try again tomorrow. Right. And, um, and this with intermittent fasting, I find it's like, two meals. I can handle these two meals. That's what my body wants. Sometimes these two meals are within a five hour window. Sometimes they're within an eight hour window. Sometimes that window is a little earlier in the day. Sometimes their windows pushed back a little bit. So it affords you this flexibility and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'll put it this way. If your light signal is strong, like if you're getting a strong circadian signal from exposure to natural light outside throughout the day, then Food is another timekeeper. It turns, it turns on the, the peripheral clocks in your digestive tract. So it does help your body keep time, keep circadian rhythm, so to speak. But I find it's less influ it, it, it's less important than the light. So if your light environment is strong, if you have a strong light circadian signal, then you can shift your fueling window around as long as you're pretty much eating within the natural daylight cycle, like not having your fueling window starting at midnight, then your body, it's a beautiful thing for your body to do that intermittent fasting. Yeah. And sometimes, um, certain days, I, I don't know. I, I listen to my body when it needs to eat, then I eat. Um, but sometimes like you were saying, you know, sometimes just two meals a day is all I need. And mm -hmm. I might, um, get up and, you know, shower, get dressed and do whatever and have my bulletproof coffee because I do that every morning. Mm -hmm. Um, I really like, it. I look forward to that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of like, um, most of the time, I go outside and sit on the deck, or even if it's kind of rainy, I'll sit on the screened in porch mm -hmm. and have my, that's just like my little, you know, how people ritual, have little little ritual. this is my little comfort thing in the mm -hmm. morning to start my day. And, uh, once I've done that, you know, I often won't eat till two, maybe three o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. I just, I kind of, I guess I, I don't want to say forget, but that's kind of what it feels like in a way, you know, I just don't need to eat. Mm -hmm. I don't think about eating because freeing. Uh, yeah. I need to. That, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful freeing thing to be, because your body isn't, it's, it's not a stress for you to figure out where your next fuel source is coming from. Cause your body says I, I can burn my own body fat. That's why we all store body fat so that we can burn it if we need to. Um, really quickly on touching on that, that, that morning, um, kind of like a rich, like a, like a comforting ritual for you, right? Mm -hmm. Forever. My mother, um, would hear what I would say. Right. But she wouldn't, you know, and she would try bits and pieces and bits and pieces, but her sticking point for not doing, uh, intermittent fasting was the fact that she loved at the time, 2% milk in her coffee. Blech. Um, she loved 2% every morning. And so it was just like, you know, I can't, I can't give up my 2% milk in my coffee every morning. 
And so I said, well, mom, what if you switch to a full fat source in your coffee, like heavy cream, right? Why don't you switch to heavy cream? And have you, and why don't you try being one of those people that does an early fueling window, right? Like you, you do, you have that at 6am and you cut yourself off at 2pm, right? Like, you know, you, you give yourself a window like that, just see, you know, she's retired too, right? So it's like, so, so she's got the flexibility to do that. And sure enough, she, she struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled because she thought she had to open her fueling window at noon or later. Right. And so she, she just got mad at herself. I can't do it. I can't do it. And instead she found, found that when she shifted her fueling window earlier, it was a beautiful thing for her body. She, she had that, she had that ritualistic, beautiful, comforting cup of coffee in the morning, probably two, and that's fine. She would have a nice big mid-morning breakfast, right? That really, along with her outside light, you know, she would go outside and, you know, have her big, big uh, meal of the day. And then throughout the rest of the day, she was just like, you know, she had little things here and there. She had, and then she had her little, she had her little treats, right? So she found a keto fudgesicle and keto popcorn. And once she found her treats at the end of the day, she was like, my, I can close my window. I just had my fudgesicle. I just had my bowl of popcorn. I'm good to go. Right. And, and she physically wasn't hungry because she had taught her body how to burn fat as a fuel source, but that's where we have to adapt it. There are that was important to her, right? So I'm not going to kick her in the butt and say, mom, you know, give up your coffee or drink it black. You know, if, if that was going to make her just, bleh, just like pull, pull her away from pull her out of that tr trying intermittent fasting. So I'm glad, right. I'm glad that you figured that out. I'm glad she figured that out. So it's not about this set perfect starting time. You have to find out what works for your body. Well, you know, and one more thing about, um, you know, eating and, um, not having these planned times with these planned foods or meals. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that has helped me tremendously, well, first of all, um, before I was diagnosed with Lyme, I was so sick. And the first thing, or the last thing I did was I dug in the bottom of my purse and found a business card that a lady at, uh, who owns a knitting shop or a yarn shop had given me months before. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, at least maybe, maybe I just, if I eat better, maybe I'll feel better too. Cause I didn't know what was wrong. Well, the first thing I did was I, um, I threw out or if it hadn't been open, I gave it to a food pantry, everything in my house that was, was sugar. Mm -hmm. I mean, not, not the whole carb thing yet, but this was just anything, sugar cookies, you know, packages of packages of sugar, um, anything at all that was sweet, I, I got rid of it. I got rid of it all in one day. I just, one Saturday, I just came in the kitchen. I pulled everything out of the cupboards and that's what I did. Now I did it because, um, well, because my kids are grown and gone. And because of the fact that if it was here, I was probably going to sneak it on myself, you know? So I didn't do that. But one of the things that I've learned over time that helps me, especially now that I intermittent fast is, um, not necessarily on Sundays now, but it used to be that way when I was still working. Um, I put on a movie or watch a football game or whatever here in the kitchen. And I would get out uh, my veggies or different things and I would prep things for the week. So now, um, you know, like when I, I'll buy cucumbers and I'll come home, you know, I'll go to the farmer's market and I'll, you know, I'll slice them up, put them in a, a glass container I use wet jars. I love those things. Mm -hmm. um, but then that way, if I have like um, white fish uh, spread or whatever, you know, yep. uh, salmon spread, I, well, I don't do crackers anymore. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> and I don't, I don't miss it now that I've found new things, but anyway, um, I've already got that stuff sliced and ready, cleaned and everything that is huge. So, you know, if at two o'clock in the afternoon um, and I haven't eaten yet, but I just feel like a little something. Mm -hmm. And I can go to the fridge and get that. I don't have to say, oh gosh, now I got to go to the fridge to do this, you know, take it out, do this. I just, for, for the week or for four or five days, I will do that kind of thing. Another thing I do when, with intermittent fasting, because um, you can get keto flu <laughs> and um, you know, you've got to kind of work with your electrolytes. Well, mm -hmm. you know, in the old days, electrolytes were Gatorade and things like that. Well, no longer. <laughs> <Pedialyte>. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> So I just, I use, this is a brand, just one brand that that's I my, use. that's my favorite brand. Yeah. I use this, but you know, then when I'm traveling or like when I was with my family this last week, you know, I'm not going to carry this big thing around. So then I've also bought like the individual serving so yeah. I can throw those in my purse or my bag or whatever. And I've got them with me. 
And that's really helpful. And just to know that I have another source for electrolytes, mm -hmm. really nice. Those are great. I love the Ultima brand. They're zero carb. I love the blend of electrolytes. And I do feel like it can't be underscored enough that when your body is shifting from a sugar burner to a fat burner, you drop a ton of stored water, like, like this water bloat, if you will. So, you know, you hear on it, oh, this research article came out and said that is, if you go to a low carb or a ketogenic diet, all you lose is water weight. Well, Sure. The first little bit, all you do lose is water weight because your body is dropping a bunch of stored sugar. You're dropping a bunch of water that gets held on when you're storing sugar. And so you are, you're losing or needing to rebalance your electrolytes. So you need more salt. I will consume a lot more salt. You need more electrolytes. So that Ultima electrolyte powder is great. And you need more water too. Now, once your body, I have found that once the body becomes a potent fat burner, like you're, you're able to get into ketosis. I actually feel like I need less water. Cause I think my mitochondria are so efficient at making water for me. And then I get out into the sunlight. I combine my ketosis with sunlight so that I go outside and I help structure that water and energize that water in my body it only ramps up the body's ability to make energy when you combine ketosis plus sunlight. Um, but that's a good point to start off with. If you're transitioning and you're having a hard time, you got to get your electrolytes in. you got to drink your water and there's no better way. And those things taste good too, right? Though that, that also almost like a yeah, little treat, really like, do. tastes like lemonade. Um, and so it, it tastes delicious too. So it's a really good way if you need to consume more water to get your water in. So thank you for bringing that up. So I don't know if this fits in there or not, but um, I also do um, molecular hydrogen or is mm, that late, later I on? love molecular hydrogen and we can talk about that. You know, they just came out with some, um, some really awesome research articles. The majority of the research done on molecular hydrogen is out in Asia, mostly Japan. And they just came out with some really interesting research articles on how it's good for COVID stuff um, because it's a really, really selective good antioxidant, but it, it, it's a really good antioxidant for, I believe the arteries too. So um, I'm a big fan of molecular hydrogen as an anti-inflammatory, uh, uh, a selective antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, which is a good thing, right? Um, and so, yes, that's something that we can talk about. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think our food talk is done. Like how to be a fat burner, you know? You, you, oh, I do too. I yeah, think that's I good. Just, let, let's go to give up. Just don't give up. Yeah, Whoever just don't give up. Listening, please right. don't give up because like I said, it took me like eight months to mm -hmm. get one where I am now with, I'm pretty much, I'm more, I'm in ketosis more than I'm not. When do you find it most beneficial to test your ketones? I know some people ask that question. When? Um, well, I usually wait for like an hour after I'm up in the morning and then I'll test my ketones and my, um, and my glucose. Is that because you yeah. have that cortisol awakening response, a pretty strong cortisol yeah, awakening response? Yeah. Okay. And okay. also, um, well, and I do this just because I'm curious, um, cause that's my nature. Um, when I'm not feeling well, mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever it might be brain foggy or what, whatever, uh, I will test my ketones and my blood sugar then too. And surprisingly, sometimes that isn't even uh, the effect. I've, you know, there's lots of other things that can be going on in a human body, sure. but I do like to just know, is it my blood sugar? Is yeah. it not? But yeah, absolutely. Uh, lately everything's been pretty good. So yeah. um, woo, woo. Yeah. that's good. I know. Okay. So the final episode that we're going to discuss today is sleep and autophagy. Mm -hmm. And, um, sleep is really a time when our body can turn on its most potent repair mechanism. And one of those repair mechanisms is called autophagy. Auto liter mean autophagy means self eat, right? Auto means self phagy means eat. Literally the body has a program that's built into the mitochondria. The mitochondria signal it. Um, and it tells the cells to eat up any damaged proteins. And remember, we are just basically cells full of proteins and structured water, right? We're just chock full of proteins in this exclusion zone water. And um, when, and, and the body can do two things with those proteins. When, when the proteins are broken, the body can either need to make like a signal that they can tag it and signal that that protein needs to be completely broken down. And we got to make a whole new protein or we can use autophagy, which is more of like a recycling process. So it's like one of them is more energy intensive, um, where you have to break it all down, get rid of it, and then build something brand new. Or this one is, well, this part still works. This part kind of works. This part's broken. Oh, this part's great. And so you keep what's great and you kind of repair what needs to be repaired. And then you replace the one part that might need replacing. And that's what autophagy does. And it's signaled by the mitochondria and it needs melatonin, right? So that's why it pairs with sleep because when the mitochondria 
sense darkness. They, they can make their own melatonin. They can make melatonin. We don't just make melatonin in certain parts of the brain. Like we've been taught, like the pineal gland is the only place that makes melatonin. No, we actually make it on site when we need to for autophagy, the, mel- the mitochondria. And, um, and we use that melatonin to turn on this autophagy process. The other t- thing that this melatonin does at night, which is very important is it turns on apoptosis which is our um, cells signal. It's a cellular kill switch, right? So if a cell recognizes that it's become senescent or it's become dysfunctional, like the cell says, I am beyond repair. And so the mitochondria signal for it to be killed, right? This is, this is self-sacrifice of one cell for the good of the rest of the tissue. And we want that, right? Because what happens if a cell does not, is unable to turn on apoptosis? Well, it, this, this, this dysfunctional cell grows and grows and grows and divides and divides and divides and grows unchecked and it's, it's, it becomes this dysfunctional mass that we call a tumor. And so at, that's why at night we need sleep and we need that sleep to repair the broken parts, to kill the cancerous cells, if you will. And then just so that we can wake up in, an, in a less inflamed state than when we went to bed. Thoughts and questions, Carol? Where- well, probably my biggest struggle mm-hmm. is getting that that deep full night sleep. Um, and I'm going to be the first to admit that for the longest time I fought, um, those sleep signals, you know, I'd be sitting, maybe watching TV. No, you'd be knitting. You would always be knitting, knitting, knitting (laughs) with my, in fact, my kids used to say, mom, you knit when you're sleeping. I'm like, oh my gosh, (laughs) (laughs) like dogs when they're dreaming, they sometimes I'm not going to give up. I'm going to do one more row. And then, (laughs) um, but I would, uh, and, and I still, very honestly, I still do have that problem somewhat. One of the things that made me um, not get into bed when I was tired and it was like, you know, I really should go to bed, but mm-hmm. I want to watch this show. Yep. And then um, Carrie, in all honesty, you were the one that changed that a little bit by <laughs> saying, well, just DVR the show and watch Record it the show. <laughs> And so that's actually, that's been a big help, surprisingly. I mean, just that mm-hmm. little suggestion because I'd be like, well, gosh, I really want to watch this show. Eh, I'll, I'll watch it tomorrow. And I don't have a problem with that now. Um, but, oh, going to bed. Well, I mean, I think, I think I still do fight that somewhat. You you do, but I think you hit the nail on the head. Like there's a couple of things. Number one, it's, you have to, just like we expect babies to go to bed and we give them a full routine. We, we can't just go from like mind reading a bunch of news, right. Or whatever it's doing, like, you know, surfing the web or is that too, do people say that anymore? Do people say that anymore? <laughs> um, so being online or like being on social media, um, we, we, we can't just go from this stimulating activity in our brain and then think, okay, I'm going to go into my bed now and boom, I should fall asleep and I should be in this deep sleep. We, we need to do a couple of things, right? We have to prep ourselves for sleep. We need darkness, extreme darkness. Some people need it to be very dark when they sleep because for some people, they don't start really making that enough of that melatonin until about four hours after the brain starts to sense darkness. So picture this, right? Picture this situation. It's the middle of winter, right? So in Michigan, it gets dark at five, five thirty, and we come home and it's like, well, what do we do? Well, we got to flip on all the lights, right? So we can make dinner and then the kids can do their homework. And then we're going to watch sporting event or whatever. Um, and then, you know, we flip on lights to go to the bathroom, brush our teeth. Like artificial light is on all the time, even though the, even though nature has signaled to us that it's time to start to, you know, wind our day down, we've art completely artificially removed that from the equation. So while my brain might've thought, oh yeah, as I was driving home from work, I was starting to get sleepy, right? Because it's dark outside. Then bam, you just flooded your brain with light. So you're not going to get that sleep signal. So number one, we have to create that really dim environment. And that's where the blue blocking glasses. And I wish I had my, I've got like my, my 47 blue blockers from, from like Midwest red light therapy and other places like that. But, um, I've got, you know, I've got the, the yellow ones, I've got the amber ones, I've got the red ones. And if you have sleep issues, if you have problems with getting to sleep on time, like at at an earlier, in an earlier time window, those red glasses are potent, potent stimulators. So Carol, what you can do right now, now that you're really good at seeing that sunset and I'll give yourself permission to do this. You go outside. And your, your brain has recognized that the sun has set. You come inside and you put the red ones on. Get You, you can borrow mine. Oh, next time I see you, I'll let you I've borrow got, it. I've got red as well. 
Put the red ones on. Okay. okay. And then honor that fatigue, right? Let your body recognize that you're going to get tired because you just, your brain just said, oh, the sunset, right? So we're going from daytime to night. And then you're blocking the artificial light frequencies that are meant to, that are actually stimulating to your brain. And so your brain should really start to be producing melatonin, deep, deep amounts of melatonin for you. Uh, so that when you are asleep, you're going to start to get into that deep sleep autophagy, that deep sleep repair. So honor your fatigue and go to bed, right? Go to bed and do make note, right? I have found this to be true that, um, as someone's brain clears out inflammation. If someone clears inflammation out of their body, they need less sleep. They need less sleep. So there is a range of what's considered healthy. And there's there, it's a, it's a, it's a curve where it's not that more is better. People who actually require more than nine hours of sleep are found to be in a way more inflamed state than people who require seven hours of sleep, like six and a half. So I do believe that that window is about six and a half hours to eight and a half hours and somewhere in there. And just make note that there, there are times when, you know, in the middle of winter, it may, that window may want to shift earlier. Your body may be exhausted by seven 30, eight o'clock, honor your sleep, and then just see what it does throughout the night. It's way better to get my grandma used to say this grandma, Trudy, she used to say, it's way better to get sleep earlier in the night than it is to, to, you get way better. Like for every hour you get to sleep before midnight, it counts as like two hours of sleep that, uh, as opposed to the it's sleep that you get after midnight, there's something really restorative about that time window before midnight in terms of your body's healing capabilities. Wow. <laughs> Good to know. Um, we should all live on farms. <laughs> we, yeah, we, that's, that's a, that's a great, you know what last, that's actually a last thing I know I've been talking about. I, I want to bring that up. This is a time for a circadian reset, right? One of the best things you can do is er, you do some urban camping. So literally when, because we're, this is fall in Michigan, it's a beautiful time of year. So we should be opening all of our windows. We should be getting the light frequencies into our environment as much as possible get it, and keep literally turn off anything that's artificial use fire in the fireplace, block, block your eyes with blue light glasses, you know, in case you feel like you're using screens, but try not to see yeah. you. We don't even need, like, we're going to get to the point where we don't even need, we don't need air conditioning at night. We don't need heat yet. It's you can literally turn off all the electricity in your house. Right. I mean, if you, you, you might want to keep your refrigerator running, um, <laughs> but you can, like you can, there's some kill switches that you could turn off just to really try to make your environment as close to nature as possible. And there was a study found that people could recover 80% of their circadian rhythm. If they did that for one weekend, that's wow. pretty, that's pretty powerful, right? It is powerful. So I, I have a couple of quick questions sure. or things to say. One is um, I have, um, they're clear though. I guess they'd be for daylight, but I have um, blue blocking readers because mm -hmm. I like to read before I go to bed. So I put those on at least. I don't know if you if got the book lamp though, right? You have the blue blocking book lamp. Yeah, the uh -huh. I have those yeah. too. But what about those those light bulbs? You know, I went and bought the blue blocking light bulbs, but I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, what do you feel about that? I've, I mean, I think they're okay, right? I think they don't That's have. A they don't have the, the main, the, po so the blue light, blue light is a frequency that's 400 to 500 nanometers. And, and really 450 is a really potent wavelength of it's stimulate. It's a very stimulating wavelength of light. The good bulbs don't have any of that. And the best bulbs also have removed some of the green light frequencies. So that's nice. Uh, I, I think that those are okay. Um, but remember the intensity of the light matters too. So how bright it is matters in addition to what colors are in that light. And I have found that having using my red light panel before bed, like if I, if I'm getting the kids ready for bed or something, and I just, I, I just did this as an experiment, right. But I took this red light panel that I have here and I brought it upstairs into their bedroom and uh, to, to my share bedroom. And I, we were getting ready for bed, doing all our bedtime routine. And I've been using that red light device. It there's th that red light frequency. Actually, I found out stimulates melatonin production even more. And so these kids have been boom, sleeping. They've been sleeping soundly. So I encourage you that if you are going to use a light source in your bedroom to try and make it as red, like a red tone. So that would be like a red led bulb, or if you have a red light panel to use that, or you have that, that more of that therabulb, that red heat lamp bulb. So as it gets colder, that would be another good one to have. Um, just make sure you don't fall asleep with that on. Right. So right. <laughs> shuts off on a timer, <laughs> but yeah, that I think would be a, a good light source to use in the bedroom, but those little book lights too, that are like a yeah. amber, amber toned are dim and nice. 
uh, in terms of being able to just read to them and not have a bunch of overhead lighting on to wake you up. Okay, great. Anything else? Um, I think that was pretty much it. I, I know that pr promoting autophagy, um, you know, the sunlight is real important, mm -hmm. um, the intermittent fasting, the ketosis, but a couple things, and we haven't even touched that, but we maybe another session or whatever, sure. um, cold plunges and mm -hmm. um, sauna. Because those, oh, yeah. those are my next challenges. I, I think that that would be a fun fun thing to talk about. Yeah, to do, uh, to talk about cellular resilience and all that you, the things that you can get when you expose your body to those different extremes. You know, I think those are, that, that's a really good one. Um, one thing that I want to add though, to that too, to the autophagy boosters is exercise, especially high intensity exercise, right? So you get, it really will turn on autophagy. That high intensity exercise will help your body make new mitochondria at night. It will stimulate stem cell release. So it really is synergistic with the, this, the supporting the body's repair capability. So uh, not done every day, right? But doing these little bursts of high intensity, like let's say you got, you do four to eight bursts on a Tuesday, and then you do four to eight bursts on a Friday or so like, and you, and you intermix those into your week, um, th those bursts where you're feeling breathless and, and sweaty and your heart is racing. Those things are really important, a really important signal that you can give your body during the day. And then at night, your body will, will remember those signals and will boost autophagy and boost that stem cell release. So could, this is just an example, <laughs> um, because I have to empty my dehumidifiers down in my family room and it's up and down the stairs, up and down the stairs, carrying a heavy bucket. And I do get breathless and I sometimes depending, but I can get a little sweaty with that mm -hmm. would that be considered the same kind of thing i mean even though i'm not really doing an actual exercise it doesn't have to be natural you don't have to be doing burpees or anything like that right you have there's a couple of signals it's a good point there's a couple of signals that your mitochondria need to get or your body needs to get you have to get breathless your muscles have to get kind of like that burning or that yeah. fatigue and then getting like generating heat, meaning your mitochondria are making more energy for you. And it, they make more infrared, they make more heat. So you got to get hot and you got to have like muscles and you got to do something that maybe uh, if you're going to do it, it, it feels heavier. It feels hard, right? It's hard. So burning breathless, generate some heat, do something that's hard. And okay. if you're doing those things, those are potent stimuli for your mitochondria to say, okay, that was hard. Uh, Carol, what were you doing to me? I don't want to go through. I don't want it to be that hard the next time I do it. So I'm going to make new mitochondria. I'm going to boost stem cell production to repair the tissue that, that may have created. You may have created micro damage in the tissue. So I'm going to boost stem cell production. I'm going to boost autophagy to clear everything up. So the next time you ask me to do that, Carol, it's going to be just a little bit easier. See, because what I do is per, I, I, on purpose, I go up and down the stairs, you know, faster, harder, Mm -hmm. I do that on purpose. Good. I could take my time coming up, but I don't, I go one, two, three, you know, I go right up and then mm -hmm. right down, um, with the heavy bucket. <laughs> yep. That's perfect. That's, that's oh. called, I mean, I guess the technical term for that would be called burst training, but there's been a lot of studies to show that that sort of burst of intense activity is a really beneficial thing to do throughout the day. And I'm getting something done. I need to do around getting the house. Something done. Time, so, Hey, yeah. you know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, kudos to you. That's perfect. Um, I think that's, I mean, that that's probably a good place to wrap for the day, right? You think? I think yeah. so. I okay. do. I think we've talked about a lot of good things here and hopefully they'll be helpful to people. Hopefully they'll be helpful to you. Um, you know, if you have any questions on it, please let us know. Or if you have any questions that you want to have answered in future podcasts, please let me know. Uh, you can just comment those below. Um, I don't know how many of you actually ever follow me on Instagram, but Carrie B. Wellness on Instagram. If you like to get into the quantum science, that's where I really dive into that. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to continuing to do more of these podcasts. So Carol, thank you. I really appreciate it. And, uh, I know I will see, see you soon, but thank you for your time today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye.